Welcome to Living in the World International Church. We are here as doers of God's Word with signs and wonders following. If you want more information about our ministry, visit us at www.litweek.org or email us at info at litweek.org. You will never be the same again. Now it's time to listen to God's Word from Pastor Femi Alaric. Be blessed as you listen. Hallelujah, praise the name of Jesus Christ. Good morning and welcome to our Sunday ministration. It's good to be here again teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to you. I am glad when they say, let us go to the house of the living God. Happy new month to every single person. Surely the Lord shall perfect everything that concerns you in this month of perfection in the precious name of Jesus Christ. As our custom is, we are studying a new topic this month of July. And we are looking at the subject of the Holy Spirit. Many of us have been baptized in the Holy Spirit with speaking new tongues, but some of us do not have that encounter yet. Now, many of us have never known the Holy Spirit as a person. We have seen him as a it. We have seen him as an object. We have seen him as an experience like they had in the day of Pentecost. But I'm believing that God will help us this month and we will begin to know the Holy Spirit as a personality, as a person who has emotions, who has will, who has knowledge, and is part of the Godhead. For example, the Bible tells us in the books of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20, that we should not grieve the Holy Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit has emotion. I discussed this briefly on Wednesday. Now today we begin to take it a bit deeper, to begin to understand the personality of the Holy Spirit and how he walks in the life of a believer. I want to encourage us not to miss any part of this series of teaching because it will be life-changing to each and every one of us. And as you listen, I believe God will bless you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now, shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you glory and honor and we bless your holy name. You are faithful. There's no one like you, the son of the living God. Thank you for the first half of the year 2015 and thank you for the second half of this year. Thank you for the things you have in stock, O Lord. We give you all the glory. Father, as we sit at your feet to learn your word, please open our eyes of understanding. Now give us a lifetime encounter with your spirit in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your mighty name. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. Now the Holy Spirit is a person. It's part of the Godhead. Often we hear in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He has a job, he has a function. Just as God the Father has a function, the Son also had a duty on earth when he came to die for humanity. The Holy Spirit is also here at this point in time. Since he has been he has arrived on earth from the day of Pentecost, he's still around to today. And his job is quite distinct because he's supposed to guide all believers, teach us all things. And make sure that we fulfill destiny. But many of us are yet to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Or perhaps we really don't understand who the Holy Spirit is. Now, the mystery of the Trinity is something that uh, um, has baffled even the most brilliant minds around the world. Now, allow me to explain with this simple illustration. A man can be a husband. The same man can also be a father. The same man can also be an employer. But yet, it's the same man. In other words, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, they are all one. But they have different functions. And this is the mystery of the Trinity. God the Father sits on the throne. God the Son sits on the right hand side. And God the Holy Spirit is on earth right now, helping the the believers convicting those who are yet to be convicted of sin and bringing them to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. No, we need to understand who he is so that we can have a clear understanding of how to relate with the Holy Spirit. Now, imagine you want to buy a car. Finally, you look around for so long and you finally found one. And after buying the car cash down, you need two things to enjoy the car. Now, you need, number one, the key to the car. Because without the key to the car, you cannot, for example, start the ignition. Or you cannot open the boot or open the door of the car. 
or do anything with the car. You can't move the car from point A to B. Well, you can hardwire it, but it will be legal. And then number two is that you need fuel in the car. If you imagine the work of the cross as the key to the car and the Holy Ghost as the fuel in the car so that we will not die on our way to our destination but because of the Lord, what he has done on the cross of Calvary and the fuel of the Holy Ghost, we can keep moving in spite of obstacles. Now, this is one of the greatest functions of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ. Each and every one of us must have a personal relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Without these three things or without this relationship established firmly in our lives, it's easy for us to be torn to and fro by every wave of doctrine or easily besets us. And I'm praying that none of us will break when the challenges of life come in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now we begin to look at the subject of the Holy Spirit a bit more deeply this season. We understand that the Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead, is the wisdom of God, is omnipresent. That means he can be everywhere at the same time. He empowers us as believers to accomplish God's purpose on earth. I think I've given some of these reasons why the Holy Ghost is around in the first teaching. So if you missed the first teaching, please go back and listen to that. You can visit the website www.litwick.org and under the current sermon you can see it there. But why do we need the Holy Ghost in our lives? There's something so special I want to look at today. One of the ways that the Holy Spirit works is through our conscience. Now, as believers, we have a conscience. And that conscience is the moral capacity that enables us to distinguish between right and wrong. There are some people, no matter how much evil they do, they don't see anything wrong in it. But as believers, that's different. You see, every person has a conscience, like a monitor, that enables you to see what is right, what is wrong, and what is grave, so to say. But once the Holy Spirit comes in our lives, we don't see black, white, gray anymore. We see black or white. Because the words of God is quickened in our heart. It reminds us of scriptural principles that enable us to stay away from sin. It interrupts the signals in our heart so that we don't go astray. It sometimes also interprets the signals in our conscience so that we can begin to see what we are doing as right or wrong. The Bible talks about different kinds of conscience. For example, the Bible talks about a seared conscience. If you read the books of um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1 to 2, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 2, the Bible talks about those whose conscience have been seared with hot iron. Now, those who have seared conscience are simply people whose conscience is dead. Such kind of people are people who can kill and don't feel anything. They can kill a fellow man or a human being and don't feel anything. They can steal and don't feel any guilt. They can do all kinds of atrocities and not feel any form of remorse. Their conscience is dead. Now, number two, we have somebody who has a weak, a weak conscience. Now, if you read the books of 1 Corinthians 8, verse 4 to 12, we talk about the weak conscience. And permit me to illustrate. A weak conscience person is the kind of person who cannot make their own decision. They are easily tossed to and fro by anybody. They don't have uh, their own personal sense of right or wrong. They seem to be moved by anything somebody says, especially those that exercise influence on them. Number three, the Bible talks about evil conscience. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 22. Evil conscience are those who perpetually do evil. Their thoughts are always towards evil, nothing else but evil. Number three, and number four now, we have defiled conscience. 
Titus chapter 1, verse 13 to 15. Those whose conscience is corrupted, perhaps by the by greed or by the love of money and all kind of things. And then number five, we have good conscience. Acts chapter 23, verse 1. Paul, who was a murderer, became a man of good conscience. We have also, number six, we have a blameless conscience. So our conscience is clear before God and man. Acts chapter 24, verse 16. And then number seven, we have a clear conscience. Uh, oftentimes, you know, when we, when we do things, we say, my conscience is clear. I don't think I've done you any form of wrong or anything that is um, going to hinder the move of God in my life. Sometimes some people pollute their conscience by defiling their body with alcohol, with drugs and all kind of things. Now, each and every one of us have been programmed or trained to have a conscience from the days of our youth. Perhaps those of us that grew up on our strict parents, we were told from very young age that stealing is wrong. And if we take things that do not belong to us, we are punished instantly to understand that what we have done is wrong. And oftentimes we grow up with that conscience in us that makes us understand that we cannot steal regardless of what. For example, my father, no matter how wrong you are, no matter how bad the thing you have done is, tell him the truth and the consequences will be spared. Not because he does not punish us or he does not want us to do well, but the moment you lie to him, that moment you have simply put yourself into trouble, if I can use that word. So we were taught from a very young age that lying is wrong, stealing is wrong, doing anything that's you know immoral is wrong. Number two, some people are trained by the world, the society, the school teacher, the principals at school, or perhaps the television, the media resources. And number three, some of us were taught in a church. We have been going for, to the church for so long, we have been taught that it is wrong to steal from God, that we must pay our tithes and offering, and we have learned good conscience. And then number four, most of us learned by ourselves through reading books, meditating on the word of God, and learning from the examples of others, and so on and so forth. But it's very important that each and every one of us know the role that the Holy Spirit plays in our lives. I want us to see that and begin to understand that. You see, when we were in the world, we simply do some things and we don't feel it. For example, the world has classified lying as white lie and black lie or red lie, whatever color is called. And white lie seems to be um, something that you said that is not true, but will have no harm on the other person. Or you had no intention to harm them, and there's nothing you have done that will harm them. And that, in the words of the, or in the eyes of the world, rather, is right, so to say. But the truth is, the Bible says, lying is lying. And all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. So whenever I go around and I tell somebody something, uh, even if it's half truth, I don't lie. That's not my nature. The devil is not my father. John chapter 8 verse 44, the Bible says clearly that he is the father of lies. So the devil is not my father. Jesus died for me on the cross of Calvary, made me a body fire child of God. I don't lie. But if occasionally I do not tell you the whole truth, I will have a grieve in my conscience. And I would have to tell you, look, this is the whole picture. Why? Because the Holy Spirit in me would not allow me to go to bed having that on my conscience. If you don't feel any form of remorse after you have done something that is wrong and you know within yourself that is wrong, the Bible says a spiritual man judges all things. He himself is judge of no one. You're judge of no one because within you, you have the Holy Spirit that convicts you of sin and things that you have done that is wrong before the Father. If you're going to have a relationship with the Holy God, because the Bible says without holiness is it possible to see God, you must have your heart 
submitted to the Almighty God through His Holy Spirit so that your prayers will not be hindered and it will not keep you from receiving the very best of God for your life. It will stop you from trying to do things that are immoral. Some people can easily fornicate or commit adultery and yet feel nothing the next morning when they go before the Almighty God in church and lift up holy hands and say, Lord, I worship you. Who are you worshiping? God or the devil? So we must begin to understand the work of the Holy Spirit and when we must begin to allow him perform his duty in our lives as believers. Now, let's go further. Though. Why do we need the Holy Spirit in our conscience? It's impossible to live a victorious life without the Holy Ghost. It is the power that quickened Jesus Christ out of the grave after three days. Surely that power we need in our own high life too. So we cannot live a victorious life without having the Holy Spirit in our heart. A believer needs the Holy Spirit's guidance day and night. You see, we are constantly confronted with evil. When we wake up, when we step outside our door, Sometimes you will hear, don't do this. You will hear, don't do that. Don't leave your home. Why? Because the Holy Spirit can see things and knows things. Remember, it's omnipotent, omniscience, and he knows all things. So, not only does he convict us of sin, he guides us into all truth. He enables us to overcome the booby traps of the enemy. Because many are the affliction of the righteous. The Bible says the Lord delivered them, deliver him from them all. Now, for him to deliver you from all the afflictions, you must submit to his authority. Ladies and gentlemen, we must allow full space or residence for the Holy Spirit in our heart. Remember, the Bible calls our body the temple of the Holy Spirit. As I begin to close, Many of us are yet to give the Holy Spirit space in our lives. So constantly the devil has an accusation against us before the Father. Even here on earth, we find it difficult to sleep at night. But once you give the Holy Spirit space after salvation, obviously, that's the first step, then you allow the Holy Spirit to take over, to begin the work, to finish the work which he has begun. Remember, we read the books of 1 Corinthians 12 verse 3 that nobody could say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit of God. Now, if you allow him to continue that work and perfect it, your courage will develop. You will be so strong that the devil will be afraid of you. Why? Because you can face difficulty in your face and stand strong. You can face your past in the face and stand strong. Now. Paul was a murderer. We all know that. He persecuted a Christian. As a matter of fact, in books of Acts chapter 9, he was on his way down to prosecuting more Christians when he met the Lord. But yet, after he had an encounter with the Lord, after that, his conscience was no longer seared and he became a man of good conscience who could walk blamelessly before the people and before the Lord. You remain calm in spite of attacks. Jesus told us clearly in the books of John chapter 16 verse 33 that in this world we will have troubles. So when you have a good conscience, you are not afraid when your door is knocked because you know you have not done anything wrong. And if your maker rings the bell and says it's time for rapture, you know you shall be caught up with the Father. Your life flows with peace that passes all understanding. We know that the Holy Spirit is here in the world today. He's here to regenerate us. He is here to sanctify us, to dwell in us and empower us. He's here to intercede for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. And we have the seal of the Holy Ghost as a proof of our salvation. So it's important as believers that we make space in our heart for the Holy Ghost. Listen, folks, 
We cannot live a victorious life against the enemy, against the world, without having the power of the Holy Ghost at work in us. Let the power of God, which raised Jesus Christ from the dead, begin to work in your life. And you will never be the same again. It changes. It transforms. He moves you from where you are to where you ought to be. I can testify of the Holy Ghost in my life. I've encounters with him. When I'm about to go astray, he's the one that will always put me back on the right track. When I'm about to make decisions that is detrimental to my destiny, he's the one that will pull me back. So allow that same Holy Ghost to pull you back onto the path of righteousness that will help you be able to look back and say, thus far as the Lord helped me. None of us can accomplish and run spiritual race in the energy of the flesh. Just as you cannot run your vehicle on an empty tank, you need the power of the Holy Ghost to flow through you so that you can begin to move at the same pace where God wants you to move. Remember, when the hand of God came upon Elijah, in other words, when the Spirit of God came upon Elijah, he had trying the child of Ahab, and I'm praying that the hand of God will come upon you this month of July and you will outrun your enemy in every facet of life in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Your conscience which has been seared and I'm believing that God will revive it this month in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Every evil conscience, every weak conscience in the name that's above every name is destroyed today. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, begin to live a victorious life. Stand for the Lord. Give the Holy Ghost space in your life. It is well with you in Jesus' precious name. Now shall we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you glory and honor. And we bless your name. We thank you so much, Lord, because you are faithful. It is you alone who is worthy. And I'm praying, Father, that you shall give us a clear and a good conscience to the glory and praise of your holy name. Lord, let your Holy Spirit fill us. We'll open our hearts to your Holy Ghost right now. Come in and take residence in us in, in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, the Almighty God. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus.